Today we're going to be learning Yavamo Daf Ayin Tet. Today's Daf is sponsored by Caroline and Victor Ofstein in honor of their son Shalom's wedding to Yocheved Davidowitz today. May their home be filled with Torah, learning, and mitzvot, and bracha and simcha always. Today's Daf is sponsored by Ruth Leah Kahn, Jessica Schlar, and Emily Michelson in loving memory of their mother, Kadima Michelson, Kadima Batar of Avram Tzvi Ben Sion Bechaya, on her fourth year at site. And today's stuff is dedicated to the memory in the memory of all those young children murdered in the shooting yesterday in an elementary school in Texas. Thoughts and prayers are with those who were injured and traumatized. Okay, we're going to get started with, uh, actually, somewhat coincidental, a story about murder. Okay, a little bit different, but it is going to be a pretty horrible uh, story that we're going to get into. So we were in the middle of trying to figure out why David forbade the Givonim from marrying, the Nitinim, right? They're called the Nitinim. We'll see today why they're called the Nitinim. Um, so we're in the middle of a story where there was no rain for three years. David Amelech went and, and tried to figure out, okay, first year he thought it was because of idol worshippers. Second year he thought it was because of those doing other kind of sins, maybe znut and things like that, prostitution, etc. Then he couldn't find that. Then the third year he said maybe it's people who promised they would give charity and didn't hold up to their commitment. And all those, there were verses that connected between no rain and those actions. In the end, he goes, and that's where we ended, he goes to ask Pnei Hashem, which they explain means the Urim V'tumim, right, which was able to bring answers to all sorts of things. And we're going to start with there about seven lines from the bottom, um, or six lines, seven lines. Vayomer Hashem, Vayomer Hashem. So now God answers him, presumably through the Urim V'tumim. El Shaul, ve'el, I'm quoting now verses, we're going to go, Back and forth between verses from what appears in Sefer Shmuel and actually like with the story that the Gemara is filling in, the details that don't appear. So, Vayomer Hashem, El Sha'ul ve'el Beit HaDamim al HaShechimit HaGivonim. Why are you not getting rain? Because of Sha'ul, which we're going to see what that means, and because of the house of blood, because he killed the Givonim. It doesn't really say anywhere that Sha'ul killed the Givonim. So, we're going to have to figure out what this is. And what is El Sha'ul? El Shaul Shalon Ispad Kalacha. It's not really because of Shaul, it's because of you. You didn't give a proper eulogy for Shaul. Now, David did, did give a eulogy for Shaul, but God says it wasn't befitting of a king. Okay, it wasn't a proper eulogy. And because Shaul did something terrible, he killed the Givonim. So the Gemara asks, Right, where do we see that he did this? Okay, the Yerushalmi, by the way, brings two answers. We only get one in the Bavli. Um, we have the whole story with Doeg Adumi. We were talking about Doeg, remember? We said he tattletailed on the city that they were gave food to David when he was running away from Shaul. And as a result, Shaul ordered the murder of all the people of the city. Now, they weren't Givonim, so what's the connection? Well, that city, they didn't get any food because they were sustained by the people of Novi Irakonim, so he indirectly caused their murder, their death. And therefore, it's as if Shaul killed them. So that is why there's no rain. Number one, you didn't give a proper paid for him. Number two, he did something awful by causing the indirect death of the Givonim. Katava. El Shaul, Shalon is pag kalcha, katavala shayimita givonim. There's something weird about this. Number one, he's saying, well, let's start with the second one. Shaul did something terrible. And then you're saying, but you didn't eulogize him properly, right? If you didn't eulogize someone properly, we would assume we're talking about someone who was deserving of a eulogy, a nice eulogy. And Shaul, you're kind of saying he did something terrible that he wasn't punished for. To which they say, in, yes, in fact, you do. This isn't so crazy. Damarish Lakish. What's this mishpato pa'alo? They darsh in this pasuk, pa'asher mishpato sham pa'alo. When you're putting someone up in judgment, that's when you start saying all the good things they did. In other words, you, you realize that there's two sides to people, right? It's true we're judging you for something bad, but we respect the fact that you've done good things also. It's a nice concept. So Amar David, David says, okay, look, you want me to fix the fact that I didn't give him a proper eulogy? Well, Shaul Nafgalu Tresa Yarche Shata, he died more than 12 months ago. Velo Darche in the Mispide, you don't eulogize people after 12 months, so I really can't fix that. Okay? It's not a, a situation that can be rectified. We're going to see that David in this story doesn't exactly come out with, you know, 
great colors. He doesn't look amazing. He seems to not be very successful with a bunch of things, right? First, he tried to figure out for three years. He couldn't figure out why there was a draft. Now God tells him, well, you didn't eulogize Shaul. And he says, what am I going to do? I can't. And soon the Gibbonim are going to want to do something terrible. And if he's going to try to prevent them, and he's not going to be successful either. So he definitely doesn't come out looking great in this story. Nitinim, what about the Nitinim? Well, Nikrinu v'nefaisinu. Let's call them and let's appease them. And then once we appease them, right, what's the issue? We have an undealt with situation. We'll deal with the situation. We'll beg for forgiveness. They'll forgive us. You know, we'll give them something. They'll forgive us. And then the rains will come. We'll resolve the issue. Okay, you know, and he's saying that has paid. There's nothing I can do about it. You're not going to punish me for that. So now we're back into the verses. He says to the Givonim, What can I do for you? Well, how can I atone for this? And then to then cause you to bless the land so that the rains will come. Right? It sounds like it's clear he's got some ulterior motives here, right? It's not like he's going out of, right? Think, remember this concept of ulterior motives. Because we talked about the Givonim, what did we say? They they converted to Judaism. Remember, they came in the time of Yoshua, and they faked out that they were not locals, so that they would make peace with them. They made a breed, and right, they kind of somewhat converted to Judaism, but really because they just didn't want to get killed, or they just thought it would be better for them. So they came to Judaism with ulterior motives. So now the pesach continues by Yomalah Givonim, and Lanu Kesef is a Havim Shaul Vim Beito. Ve'en lanu ish. You have to read the rest of the pasuk. En lanu ish la mi pi Israel. Okay. Number one, money and gold, uh, silver and gold. That's not going to help us. We're not interested in your money. Number two, we're not interested in in murdering any Jews on account of this. What do we want? Okay. So now they say, right? So he says, okay. It sounds like they don't want anything. So it's a little confusing. So he says, I'm just reading the pasuk. It doesn't quote it here. The he- the continuation of that pasuk. We're in Shmuel Bet chapter twenty one. Verse 4. So, so what can I do for you? So here comes the real harsh thing. We only want, we don't want to kill people in Israel. We want seven of Shaul's descendants. And we're going to murder them. Okay? Lahashem. Okay, to God. Vigomel. So David is horrified. He doesn't want to give over seven people to murder them. So what does he say? Right? He thought probably he could pay them off somehow. Mephias Philopasinu. He tries to appease them, but it's to no avail. Amal, so his reaction to this is, and this is why we brought this whole story, although we will get to finish the end of the story, despite the fact that we've already gotten what we want. Our nation has three basic simanim. Okay? You can be part of our nation if you have these three things. Those who have mercy, those who are, get embarrassed. Okay, I don't know the best way to translate. I'm sure in the English is a good, better translation for this word. And gomle chasadim, those who do chesed for others, right? Who do good, good deeds. Rachmanim, how do we know this? Dichtiv. Vinatan lecha rachamim v'richamecha v'hir b'chal. Okay, we're quoting psukim from around the Torah. So, rachmanim. Because it says, okay, let me just look at the verse, the whole verse. This is Dvarim chapter 13. He will give you Rachamim, Virichamecha, Virbacha, Kasher Nishba Lavotecha. Okay, God will bring upon you mercy, right? And, right, you will, you will have mercy as well. Okay, next. Baishanim, okay, which I see some people help me out here. Bashful, shy, shame faced, okay, something like that. Dichti, Ba'avor, Tie, Yirato, Apnechem. So that the year of God is on your face. Now, if the year of God is on your face, the fear of God, that means that you're basically, you're going to end up, right? that's why those translations don't exactly do it. You're not, it's not that you're bashful. It's that right, you, you have someone above you. There's God. So you're willing to accept shame. Shame face maybe works. Anyway, those are two. Those are, uh, that's that pasuk. And the third one, Okay, this is a verse from um, Breshit. This is for Avram Avinu. So it's about banav epitoch harav, right? In other words, and then they will go in the way. La asot stakau mishpat to do good deeds, right? And judgment, righteous, just behavior, etc. Um, I see 
posted, I forgot now what you wrote, but it was a good one, right? Humility maybe is a better word. Okay, even though usually we call that an ava, but it does seem like here a bishanim would be more humility. Okay, so now he says the following. So anyone who has those three traits, which obviously the fact that these people are willing to take nothing other than murdering seven people shows that they have no mercy. Okay, and therefore they cannot come into the nation. I was thinking about the fact that, right, when you go to convert, a person goes to convert to Judaism, they go to a Beitin, and the Beitin asks them all sorts of questions. I've never heard that they've asked them questions about their personality and are they Baishanim, are they Rachmanim, right? It's more they ask, do you know this halacha? Do you know how to be, right? The technical things about Judaism, obviously, it's hard to ask someone a question. Are you merciful? Are you, right? But you don't often see these criteria. This whole sugi is actually a fascinating sugi about converts in general. You're going to see as the story develops, um, very appropriate as we're heading towards Shavuot and this weekend around the country, there's Vahavtim and Tagir, right? It's whole thing to try to get people to have awareness about um, Gerim and, and the things that they go through. So anyway, um, in light of that, it's very interesting that we have this stuff. So these people are not Ratwoid to come into the nation. Now what happens? He, so now the king, David Amelech, basically goes along with him. Here you see he basically gives up. He realizes there's nothing he can do. And he goes and he gives them seven people from the house of Shaul. Now this is a crazy thing. David's going to handpick which seven people are going to die. So he takes two that were from a concubine of Shaul. We're going to see her later in the story. At Armoni, Ved Mephiboshet. Okay, and the five sons of Michal Bat Shaul, um, they, they were born to Adriel ben Barzilai the Macholati. So, why specifically these? Amar of Huna, right? Because how on earth could David start to choose who's going to live and who's going to die? So, Amar of Huna, have a room with Naron, Kosha Aron Koto the Koto the Mita. I don't exactly know how this worked, but he put them past the Aaron Kodesh. Anyone who the Aaron kind of held back or something, it's not exactly clear, but it's like the Urim Vitumim. There was some sort of sign. Those went to death. So we left God the one to determine this because obviously, right again, it doesn't say so in the verse, but that's what they assume because otherwise it doesn't make any sense. But Matzav Rav Chana what do you mean? He didn't decide at all. Vayachamola melecham mefibosheh ben Yonatan ben Shaul. It says he had mercy on him. So that sounds like he went by the Aaron, the Aaron Koto. He was supposed to die and, shall, and David had mercy on him and he didn't allow him to be one of the dead. And instead they picked someone else. So that's a little bit strange. How could he have done that? They say, ah, shalom hevigo. No. He didn't let the, he, he let the Aaron decide. And, and this Rachmanut on the son of Yonatan, because you know, he was so close with Yonatan, was he just made sure that he wasn't one of those who passed in front of the Aaron. That's how he saved him. Now they ask, what are you talking about? What, David was allowed to say, oh, listen, I'm not letting you go in front of the Aaron? That seems crazy. It's unfair, right? How could he be so unfair and, and not let him go and cause someone else to die instead? He really did get chosen. But after he was chosen, he begged for Rachamim and God let him free. That doesn't resolve any issue. That's pretty much showing favor. So, okay, it wasn't that he didn't pass him in front. It wasn't that he passed him in front, he got chosen, and then David got him out of it. No, it was that he prayed before he passed in front of the Aaron, hoping that his prayer would help save him, and in fact it did. And he didn't get pulled by the Aaron because David had prayed. Now, it's also still Masupanim, but at least it's not a noticeable one, right? Because he went just like everybody else. It was just that David's prayer seemed to have helped him. Now wait, there's a whole problem with this entire section. What's happening here? Basically, God is allowing, you know, it's true, it's the Givonim, but where are the Nitinim, right, Givonim, who are the Nitinim? But basically, God is allowing this terrible thing to happen, that seven kids of Shaul are going to be killed, children and grandchildren, because of a sin that Shaul himself did. So, don't we know that sons don't die for the sins of their fathers? Begomer. Better to uproot one word in the Torah, meaning we can go against the Torah verse for this sake. 
Al Yitchalel Shem Shamayim Befrahesa. So that the name of God is not desecrated in public. What was the issue here? The issue is that he wronged some other nation, and he hadn't been punished for it, and that's a chilul, chilul Hashem, right? If someone does something horrible and doesn't get punished, and at this point Shaul's not around to get punished, right? Why he didn't in the first place is a separate thing. But the fact that he didn't, and now we have to do something, so that's why God let this happen. What happens next? What happens next, you're going to see from the text, is that the bodies were left out for about six months, okay? From this time period after Pesach, until Sukkot. So the mother of two of these kids takes a sack. She takes a, a sackcloth. From the beginning of the Katsir until the rainy season came and the rains actually came down. Why is it significant the rains came down? Once the rains came down, remember there was a drought. Then David figured, okay, now God is a, you know, has, has taken care of this. We're good to go. So he basically left them out until such time that God showed a sign that they were forgiven for this. So now she took a sackcloth and kind of hang, hung it up there over the bodies to protect them. Uh, it was to protect the birds from getting there during the day and the animals from getting to the bodies at night. Vahakti, another problem with this verse. Right, this, this, this story seems to go against a lot of concepts we know from the Torah. You can't leave a dead body lying, right, uh, hanging on a tree. Same idea as before. Better to uproot something from the Torah. In order to bring Kiddush Hashem, right? So it goes hand in hand with not to make a Chilul Hashem and yes to make a Kiddush Hashem. What was the Kiddush Hashem that was made? Shayu ovrim veshavim omrim. People, passers-by, would say, Ma tivan shal elu? What, who are these people? And people would answer them, Halalu b'nei melachim him. These are the sons of the kings. Umasu, what did they do? Right, normally think about it. In most nations, who gets killed? The king orders the death of other people, not his own sons. In this case, it was the sons of kings that got killed. That shows a much stronger government that they're even willing to kill the sons of kings if they did something wrong. Umasu, what did they do wrong, people would ask. Pashtu yidehem begerim gururim. It's a fascinating line. They didn't help, right? They basically took away the sustenance of gerim that, that did it for ulterior motives. They weren't good gerim. They weren't proper gerim, right? And they're not even accepted. And yet they were punished for not treating someone different from them, right? A stranger, a they were punished for not treating them properly. So they, the people who saw this, right, meaning other nations, they said the following. Okay, we're back to the concept of converting. These people said, wow, what a, what a nation. This is an amazing nation. Ma, I want to be part of this nation. If this is the way they treat the B'nai Malachim and punish for a sin like this, right? they must bring people to judgment right? and, and make sure to basically make sure they have a just society. If they do this to Gerim, I see someone wrote the translation in the Quran is calculating Gerim. Right? Those who make calculations and do it right for the wrong reason, look how nice they're going to treat their own people so or protect their own people. So basically all these people said, wow, what a nation. That's a Kiddush Hashem. What was the immediate reaction? 150,000 people converted as a result of this. Okay. Now, you might ask, wait a minute. Didn't we learn that no, they didn't accept converts in the time of David and Shlomo? How does that work with this? So, Tosfat asked this question. The Ritva, there's all, all sorts of people who ask this question. Some answers are given. I'll give you one of them, which is, they didn't accept converts who came with ulterior motives, but they did accept converts who came fair and square. Now, we always talked about it, right? They accepted converts. We even talked about it with the daughter of Paro, right? They, they accepted converts who were, right, were, um, were, they wanted converts who wanted to come because everything was prosperous and everything was good and they, they didn't have a good life. They wanted a good life with Judaism. But here, they came for the right reasons. They wanted to be part of this nation because, wow, look at this nation. Now, it's a little bit of a hard story to swallow. 
I don't know if I saw dead people hanging for six months, I would say, wow, I would have joined these people. So you have to understand it a little bit in, the, in, in maybe in historical context and things were probably a little bit different then. And, and somehow this is viewed as, uh, you know, this, this amazing thing that shows how merciful they were, even though it doesn't really look very merciful by seeing uh, seven people hanging dead in the streets for six months. But it does show a just society that they take care of, you know, what needs to be done even though really they wouldn't have done it on their own either, right? In the end, it's true David helps them out, but it was really the Givonim who demanded justice. It's a little bit strange, I will admit. Okay, now, the question is, how do we know these 150,000 people converted? Where do we get that from? So they say, Shanema, we're now going to quote a pasuk from Sefer Melachim, when it comes to Shlomo HaMelech, right, we're jumping ahead. Okay, he had 70 people who were carrying heavy burdens, right? This was when they were building the temple. And 80,000 people who were, who were quarrying, you know, in the mountains. Who's to say these people were all converts? Maybe they were Jews. He didn't make servants out of the Jewish people or slaves. Vidilma Dugzor Baalma. Okay, so now we distinguish between day workers and people who were slaves. So slaves came from other nations. That was this 150,000. Maybe no, maybe the 150,000 were day workers and then they could be Jewish. So they say, fine. You can't learn it from Sefer Malachim. Skip to Divrei Hayamim Chronicles, where there's a very similar description. And here it'll be clear that they're converts. He counted all the people that had converted that were in the Jewish, that were in Eretz Israel, in Israel. Vigomer. Vayimatsu. And then it says, and they found, Meav Chabishim Elef, Vigomer. It says there were 150,000 of them. And then it says, Vayas Mehem Shavim Elef Sabal, Vushmonim Elef Chotzev Baha. So there you have, there's this connection between the Gerim, the number 150,000, and these 150,000 people that ended up working for him. So that's clear now that they were the people and that they were comforts. Okay, so we end, it's very interesting, you have this story talks about these converts that are not good converts, the Nitinim, who in the end basically caused the death of seven of these people and are considered so not Rachmanim that we don't want to accept them. But it ends with the story of converts who came willingly, right? And, and it even says, it's fascinating, right? If you talk about those different approaches, you know, do we want to be a nation that accepts converts? Do we want to be a nation that doesn't accept converts? This clearly sides on, we want to be a nation that accepts converts because they basically said the reason we allowed them to leave these bodies hanging out for six months, which goes against the Torah, was basically to show people, make this huge Kiddush Hashem, which led to the conversion of 150,000 people. So it's very interesting. The, the approach of this Gemara is clearly very welcoming of converts and, and interested in having converts come into um, our society. Obviously, it's in the context of the sugya about, you know, who can marry and who can't marry. And then there are converts that we don't want to accept, but maybe as a foil to that, they want to bring the story to show how much we do want other converts. So yes, we have a list of Amoni, Moavi, Mitzri, Adomi, you know, people who can't. But opposite that is everybody else who, you know, we're very happy to have come in. So it's interesting that there's such a stress in the story on the, the Gerim aspect. Now we're going to question, wait a minute. Nitinim David gazar alehem? Moshe gazar alehem? What do you mean? It already appears in the Torah. What do you mean David said they can't marry? Where does it appear in the Torah? The Nitinim didn't exist as far as we're concerned at that point. I mean, they existed, but they weren't relevant to us. Only in the story of Yoshua, when they come and they dress up and make it as if they came, right? They have moldy food and as if they came from really far. And that's when they became, Yoshua turns them into Choteb Memecha, right? I'm sorry, um, Shoeb Memecha and Chotve Etzim. They're going to be your tree choppers and your and your water drawer, drawers. Um, so how could we connect this to Moshe? Well, it says, "Dichtiv mechotev itzecha ad shoev memecha." In Parshat Nitzavim, it says, "Nitzavim atem kuchem ayom." You're standing all before me, and then it says, "Right, all the men," and then it says, "The women and the children," and then it says, "The converts," and then it says, "From those who shoev memecha, chotev itzecha ad shoev memecha, who are basically in a separate category, not in the convert category, which shows that people who are chotev itzecha and shoev memecha, tree cutters and and water drawers." can't convert because they're not in the convert category. So there you see Moshe already alluded to this. So they say, well, Moshe gazar lahu da. He was just talking about the people standing in front of him at that time. So he was saying, now, right now, you can't convert. But he wasn't talking about future generations. David gazar lekule da. He made it for future generations. 
But they say, no, still it doesn't jive. Akata Yoshua Gazaralayu. He was the one. Dirtiva Yitnem Yoshua by Yoma Uchot Vetsim Shoave Maim. Le Edaul and Mizbach Hashem. He was the one who turned them into Chot Vetsim and Shoave Maim. He, and basically, obviously, right, we're going to now connect that term to Moshe, which means they can't be converts. Now, obviously, they weren't talking about just the generation of Moshe because we're now later. So it must be Yoshua said already they can't. By calling them Chot Vetsim and Shoave Maimecha, he's basically saying you can't marry in. So they say, well, Yoshua Gazar is Mancha Beit Mikdash Kayam. Notice he says, you, they're going to be our slaves, basically, for drawing water and chopping trees, la eda for the people, and the Mizbach Hashem, for the Mizbach, meaning in the temple. So, he only did it when there's a temple or, 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 a, or a mishkan, right, a tabernacle, which existed in the time of Yoshua, right? Beit HaMikdash didn't exist yet. But David Gazal was Rancha and Beit HaMikdash Kayam. David said, this is going to be forever. So that's in the end what they say, that's the difference. So now they say, In the time of Rebbe, they wanted to permit them. Now it's unclear, did they want to permit them to marry? Or did they just want to permit them not to be enslaved to us anymore? Okay, they said, die, it's enough. Okay, they've been enslaved to us for this many years. We don't need them to be our enslaved to us. So, So he wanted to do it, but he looked into it and he said, listen, they were committed to us, for us, and the Mizbah Hashem. The part that relates to us, we can easily get rid of. Okay, Rashi says on what basis? Something called Hefker Beitin Hefker, we're going to see it in a little while, in a few Dapim, means the Beitin has the power to uproot Torah, like uproot things. They can take money that belongs to you and give it to someone else. So they can take slaves and say, listen, yes, they were committed to us by a different court, but we can uproot that because the rabbis have the power to move property around however they want. But we can't, they're committed to work in the Mizbech Hashem. We can't undo that. Now, in fact, in the time of Rebbe, there was no temple, there was no Mizbech, but his point is, there's still, theoretically, maybe going down in the future, there'll be Meshua Badim to us, you know, they'll be subjugated to us to do that for when the temple is rebuilt, and therefore we can't undo this promise. Because that is God's department. He has the exact opposite approach. The fact that they're committed to us, that's going to be forever. Why? We'll see in a minute. The Mizbech is no longer relevant. The Eda is still relevant. We're still in Eda. We're still a people, a nation. The part about the temple, the temple's not here. So that's easier to get rid of because it's not non-existent today. But, part about us, we can't just undo. We obviously didn't hold that this would fall into the category of Hefker Beit and Hefker. Okay, that's the end of the Sugi of the Nitinim. If you haven't yet read Flashback of Shuli from that was up yesterday, you can read it. It's got good historical piece about the Givonim, Nitinim, etc. And I forgot to mention, by the way, why are they called Nitinim? Because it says, Vayitnem Yehoshua Vayom Ahusha Vayimayim, right? He makes them Chotev Etzech and Shua Vayimayim. Vayitnem, he gave to them, right? It's a weird language. So they call them Nitinim because it was, um, he turned them into, using the word Nitina. New Mishnah. Amar Rabbi Yehoshua, Shamati Shasaris Cholet Vechotzin Meishto. I heard some contradictory traditions. One tells me that a person who can't, a man who can't have children, is obligated to do chalitza. And if he was married, his wife has to do chalitza as well if he dies without children, which he's obviously going to because he's a saris. And I also heard a tradition that the saris is lochol. It's velochol simlisho. He's not obligated in chalitza and his wife is not obligated in chalitza. And I don't really know how to explain this. So the Mishnah is now going to bring two explanations, one of Rabbi Akiva and one of Rabbi Eliezer. I'm a Rabbi Akiva. Ani Afaresh. I'll explain to you. Saris Adam, he's going to distinguish between a Saris Adam, we've seen this before. A Saris Adam is someone who became a Saris, right, by man done, it was done by man, as opposed to, or man inflicted, as opposed to a Saris Chama who was born that way. So a Saris Adam, cholet v'chotzin l'ishto, mipnei sh'ayta lo sh'at he has laws of chalitza applicable to him. Why? Because he at some point was able to have children. So therefore he's connected to this whole concept, even though now he can't. But someone born into it never was capable of having children and therefore has no part in chalitza or yibum. Chabi Yezer Omer, the exact opposite. No, he could be healed. 
as opposed to Sri Saddam, now why is it obvious that Sri Saddam can't be healed and Sri Sama can be healed? Because Sri Saddam is someone who probably they cut off part of his, his limb, okay? They cut it off, and that's the issue here. Whereas someone who is born with it just means he has something that's preventing him from being able to have children. But that could theoretically be healed, right? They believed it was maybe some disease that will go away. Or right nowadays, there's all sorts of ways to, to be able to intervene and maybe fix that problem. But if you're actually missing a part there, well, then it's not going to be able to work. So that's a Sri Saddam, like castration, right? Once you're castrated, you can't go back. So each one looks from a different perspective and therefore thinks one is kind of less likely than the other to be part of this Chalitza or Yib. Okay, he testified about this person. He was a Sri Saddam in Yerushalayim and they did Yibum to his wife. So here you see, now notice, by the way, we're going to get back to this. In the Mishnah so far, they only talked about Chalitza. No one mentioned Yibum. Here they say, remember Rabbi Akiva said, Sris Adam is part of the laws of Chalitza because at some point he could have. So now they're going to say, ah, here was this Sris Adam and they did Yibum for his wife. Lekayen divrei Rabbi Akiva. Okay, so not only Chalitza, it sounds like you can even do Yibum. So now the Mishnah goes back to discussing, we're still in the Mishnah, the Mishnah goes back to discussing the first case, which or one of the versions, right? We had Saris Cholet Cholet Either which way you explain it, each of them has a case where the Saris can't do Cholet and neither can his wife. So now, they say, that's Saris Lo Cholet We're talking about that one. Why they repeat this, we're going to talk about it tomorrow, not in today's half. It's a little bit weird because we already said it. The, right, one could just simply say, right, because they're going to say, mm-hmm. so they're comparing it. They're saying, like, just like he can't, because he can't bear children. Also, a woman who never had simane baglut, right, never had signs of maturation, any sort of physical maturation in her body, she also doesn't do chalitza. And if she was married to someone, they wouldn't do, right, she wouldn't do chalitza or, um, sorry, what would it be? Right, or yibum, sorry. She just doesn't do chalitza or yibum. Okay, now, if you have a saris who can't do yibum, he's not obligated, and he does it anyway, he doesn't disqualify her. Normally, a chalitza can't marry a kohen. But since he's not supposed to do chalitza, if he does it anyway, it's a meaningless act, and therefore she's not considered a chalitza, and therefore she can marry a kohen. But be'ala psala. But if he had a physical relationship with her, then he would disqualify her. Why? Because he's the brother of, she's the wife of his brother, which only when there's an obligation of yibum are they allowed to have a relationship. But in this case, there's no yibum. So if he ends up in a relationship with her anyway, then he's going to disqualify her for kuna because there was a bi latznut, right? It was a it was a an improper relationship. Likewise, v'chein ailonit shechatzula achim. She was married to someone, and the brothers did chalitza to her. Lopsalua, they don't disqualify her because again, she's not obligated, so it's a meaningless act. Baaluha, but if they had a relationship with her, psalua mipnei be latabi latznu. So again, if they had an act of intercourse, then that's going to disqualify her because that is an act that's a forbidden act because again, she's the wife of their brother, which is only permitted in a yibum situation. Now we're going to go back, and I saw someone ask this question, and we're going to try to figure this out. Now, normally, Ptsua Daka is not allowed to marry. So, obviously, this guy did marry. It's Chayve Lavim, right? It's a low tassing. Normally, we say Chayve Lavim Kiddushin Tovsim. The marriage is valid, even though you're not supposed to do it. So, that's why we would have Chalitza, because in the end, the marriage is valid. The problem is that according to Rabbi Akiva, remember he said Chayve Lavim Ain Kiddushin Tovsim? He holds Chayve Lavim are treated like chayve kritut, okay? Normally, right, if a father marries his daughter, it's not a marriage, because that's chayve karit. Comes Rabbi Akiva, and he holds the chayve lavim are like chayve kritut. So that's going to ask, that's going to lead to a big question on this whole Mishnah, and we're going to have three possible answers with a bunch of questions on some of the answers. Michti shamin on the Rabbi Akiva, amar chayve lavim, chayve kritut, since Rabbi Akiva himself holds chayve lavim are like chayve kritut, First Mishnah, right? Anyone who's supposed to do Yibam with somebody who is Kare to is 
exempt from Yibum, or if they were married, right, in a way that was not a valid marriage, then there's no Chayv and Yibum. And if the Yabam is forbidden to her, Chayv Karet, there's no Yibum, right? Everyone's exempt. No, no Chalitza either. So how could Rabbi Akiva, who holds Chayv Lavim, say that this Sris, that there is a case of a Saris, who's a Ptua Daka, who's not allowed to be part of the Kahal, right? We said a Sris Adam, if you remember, we already distinguished. Ptua Daka is a Sris Adam. So Ptua Daka lo Yavo Bakal, and Rabbi Akiva says, so very weird. So Amr Rabbi Ami Hacha B'mayas Kinan Kigon Shenasach Chiv Giyoret. It would have to be a case where the woman who was married is going to limit the case to a case where the brother married a convert, and you would have to say the following: Ve Rabbi Akiva Savar Ker Rabbi Yossi Damar Kal Gerim Lo Ikre Kahal. We mentioned this machloket yesterday that can Gerim marry even the Psulei Chitun, the people who can't marry others. And some people say yes, some people say no. So Rabbi Kiva would have to hold like Rabbi Yossi who says they can't marry anybody. Even a Ptua the Karad, a Giyore can marry both people who are, right, a Yisrael, Yisrael or a Levi, and can marry a Ptua Daka. So it must be the Chalitza is in a case where she was a Giyoret. Either he married a Giyoret or his brother was married to a Giyoret and now falls to Yibum to him. And since that's a permitted marriage, that's what we're talking about. That's answer number one. To which the Gemara says, wait, if it's a permitted marriage, and he only said cholets. He didn't say yibum. So in achinami, they say, oh, he really could do yibum with her, no problem. And I did Amar Rabbi Yeshua cholets. Amar Inami cholets. He only used the language of chalitza because he was trying to explain the statement of Rabbi Yeshua that I heard Sri says cholets and chotzinlo. So that's why he said it. But really, it includes yibum as well. And how do we know? Because you already know. Because I mentioned it when we read the Mishnah. Daikanami Dikatane, also you can prove it from the Mishnah because later in the Mishnah it says, Hey, Rabbi Yosho ben Betera, Al ben Megusat, Shaya bi Yerushalayim, Slis Adam, Yibum with Yishol, the Kayim to wear Rabbi Akiva. So here you say they did Yibum to prove Rabbi Akiva, so right, to show Rabbi Akiva was right. So here you see Rabbi Akiva even permits Yibum, even though the language was using really just language of Chalitza, and that's all assuming she was a Giyore. That's answer number one. But we still have a question on this. Mativ Rabba. Ptsua daka, right? He brings a source, a Tanaitic source. Ptsua daka ukutshufcha, sri sadam vazaken. Okay, so all these people we've been talking about who can't have children. O chotzim o miyabni. Okay, so far this doesn't contradict. But what, in the end, Rabbi Ami thinks it's only a case of a giyoret. Here we're going to see by the end of this bright that they're clearly talking about everybody. Okay, and not just a giyoret. And that's why we're going to have submission. So now they're going to give. What's the case where either they can do chalitza or they can do yibum? They can choose. So they're going to give two cases. Either it's they died or the brother, right, or the brother died. So the first case is they died. Ketzat, metu. So if a saris or, right, all these people, tzuadaka, kruchufcha, zaken, etc., die. Velahem nashim, velahem achim. They have wives and they have brothers. And the brothers did ma'amal and then gave a get, or did chalitza, any of these possible actions that one could do on someone who you're obligated yibum. It's valid, okay? And if they actually did yibum with her, they slept with her, then yes, it would be, they would be, that would be a valid marriage. What if their brothers died? Second case, v'am duhein. And then the Saris got up, or whoever it was, right? One of these characters. And they did ma'amar v'natnu get, and then they gave the wife a get. Oh, chaltsu, or they did chalitza. Right? Any of these things. Mashasu asu, it's valid. Okay? It's called a get. It's called a chalitza, right? The woman now can't marry a Kohen, for example. And. Ve'im ba'alu kanu. And if they engage in relations with them, then they be their yivama, basically, their wife. But here comes the big line. Now, if it was a giyoret, we wouldn't have this next line. Ve'asur lekaiman, but they can't stay married to them. Okay, in other words, it was effective what they did halachically, but they can't stay married. They have to get divorced because mishum shenema lo yavob tzu adakal kuchu pcha bekal Hashem alma bekal askinan. So Rabbi says your whole theory, Rabbi Ami, falls apart with this brayta because this brayta shows that when we say cholets or cholzin and all that, and even miyabmin, that's all valid, right? Even if she's not part of Kal Hashem, I'm sorry, even if she is part of Kal Hashem, and that goes against what Rabbi Ami was trying to say. So, Ela Amar Rabbah, he gives a different answer. 
First, she fell to Yibam Tim when he wasn't a Ptsu Adaka. So the Chiyav of Yibam kicks in, and then he becomes a Ptsu Adaka before he actually fulfills the mitzvah. That's when he does Chalitza and Yibam. And not if, right? Not in a case where, where that's what we would really do Chalitza. He wouldn't really be allowed to do Yibam. Okay? So Amalei Abaye, I don't understand. Why does he even need to do Chalitza here? The late Easter Ptsu Adaka, Venitche Asi de Yibum. The Yes, it's true that he was obligated in Yibum when the brother died because he wasn't a Ptsu Adaka. But then when he becomes a Ptsu Adaka, he should now be exempt from Yibum. He shouldn't have to do Yibum, shouldn't have to do Chalitza. Why? So now they're going to bring up, and we're going to go to today's presentation. We're back to presentations. So now we have this case that we already learned, which is Milotna. Do we not learn in the Mishnah? Rabban Gamliel Omer, In me ana mi ana, the imlav tamtina chitigdil, but it's el azom shumachot isha. Let's understand the case, then we'll understand the connection. Reuven and Shimon, two brothers, were married to two sisters. But Leah was already older and proper marriage to Reuven. And Shimon was married to Rachel, her younger sister, but betrothed by the mother or the brother. And it wasn't yet a valid Torah marriage. It's only Durabana. Reuven dies and Leah falls to Yibum to Shimon. The problem is Shimon's married to her sister. But the bigger problem is that Shimon's only married to her sister on a rabbinic level. So on a Torah level, Leah has to do Yibum with Shimon. But on a rabbinic level, she can't because he's married to her sister. And two sisters can't marry the same man. So there were different options about what to do. But this is a case where Rachel, the younger sister, could do miyun. So Rabban Gamliel, if you remember, some people said we force her to do miyun so that Leah can actually fulfill Yibam with Shimon. But Rabban Gamliel says, Im mi ana mi ana. If she did miyun, perfect. We have a resolution. Then Shimon's no longer married to Rachel. Shimon can marry Leah. That's fine. Because he was never actually married to Rachel. But, because it was only to Rabbana. But, in love, let's say she doesn't want to do Miyun. Rachel wants to stay married to Shimon. So, Tamtin Achitagdil, we wait until Rachel gets older. Okay, so now she's older. And now she's married by Torah law, because she's gotten older when they do. Right, they have uh, relations after they've already been, right, she's older. Then, basically, the marriage becomes valid, right, by Torah law. And then, Tetzel Azo Mishumachot Leah now becomes exempt because it's her, right? Shimon can't marry her because she is the, the sister of his wife. So now, what does this show you? At the moment of Yibum, okay, we're going to read it inside. Alma ate isura chotisha vedache. Right, at the moment of Yibum, when she fell to Yibum, she was permitted by Torah law. Then what happened? Once the sister got older, later, that kicked her out of the whole story. She becomes exempt entirely. There's no need for chalitza, anything else. So therefore, right, the Isr of Achotisha comes and pushes off the Yibum obligation. So hachanami neti tzor p'tzua v'nidche. Why doesn't the Isr of p'tzua daka come and override? And then he shouldn't have to do chalitza at all. So that's a weakness of Rabbas. So Ella Amar, right, because remember, he said the whole thing was, it started off when he felt she fell to Yibum. He was obligated, and then he became a Ptsu Adaka. That's when you'd have to do Chalitza. Rabbi just proved that doesn't make it. Uh, sorry, Rabbi Yos, um, Abaye just disproved him. So, Ella Amar Rav Yosef, last answer. Hi, Tana. Ha, Tana, Debe, Rabbi Akiva. He basically says, forget the question. I'm going to neutralize the question. The question was, Rabbi Akiva holds all Chayve Lavim are like Chayve Karet, in which case, this guy should be exempt from Yibum from another, with another woman, exempt from Chalitza entirely because she's forbidden to him, right? As if it's Yisur Karit. So he says, what are you talking about? The Tana of this Mishnah was someone from the house of Rabbi Kiva who held within Rabbi Kiva. There were different approaches. There's different types of Chayve Lavim. There's some that it's forbidden because of a relationship. Like, for example, Anusat Aviv, if his father had a... Oh, oh, a woman, a relationship with a woman outside of marriage, that person is forbidden to the son. Chayve lav. But, right, that would be a relative. That would be mom's there, child mom's there, it's all like karet. But this is not because of a relationship. This is because of his situation, that he's a ptsu adaka. According to some people who understand Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva doesn't think that that kid would be a mom's there. It's like Yisro karet. And that's why he obligates them in Chalitza. Okay, so you'd have to understand that within Rabbi Akiva, there's different approaches. This would have to follow one of the other approaches. Okay, we'll end with this next question, and we'll come back to this tomorrow. How do you even have him doing chalitza or yibum? The whole idea is to have your child, right, have children. 
this guy can't have children. So why is he fulfilling this mitzvah? Okay, so I'll leave it here and we'll come back to this tomorrow and we'll figure out why this is. Okay, have a great day, everybody.